Good afternoon, Chair Thompson and members of the Education Committee. For the record, I'm Connie Monk. I represent Assembly District 4. I'm pleased to present Assembly Bill 237 for your consideration. Also sitting up here with me is Chris Daly from NSEA and Nathan Anderson. We know from anecdotal evidence that education, educators have personally subsidized the purchase of supplies for years. More recent studies back up this evidence. A May 2018 report from the National Center for Education Statistics indicated 94% of the teachers spent their own money on supplies and spending averages about $479 a year. These figures are much higher for those working in low-income areas. According to the May 18th Forbes report, <coughs> teachers at high poverty schools spend almost $150, more, $150 more annually than their counterparts teaching in affluent areas. Some educators have resorted to crowdfunding sites to raise money to purchase. <coughs> Classroom supplies, the most common items that they purchase are pencils, pens, and paper. In 2015, the Nevada legislature recognized this problem and provided for reimbursement of teachers for out-of-pocket expenses incurred in connection with purchasing necessary school supplies. The first round of appropriations included a $2.5 million in each fiscal year of 2015 and 2017 biennium to the newly created teacher school supplies reimbursement account. To the extent that money was available, each teacher was to get up to $250 each fiscal year. The program was continued for the 2017-2019 biennium with the same appropriation. Educators spend money out of pocket on supplies to support students throughout the school year. However, there are other school personnel who also spend their personal funds to make schools the nurturing environment students need to succeed. The first aim of AB 237 is to extend expand its availability to other educational personnel within the school district or charter school, including counselors, nurses, librarians, paraprofessionals, and long-term substitutes. The bill also clarifies that these supplies can be for direct or indirect educational services, and it defines those terms. Let me go through the bill section by section. Sections two through five include the definitions for direct and indirect educational services and educational personnel. Section six renames the fund used for supply reimbursement to the school supplies reimbursement account for certain educational personnel. This section also allows the Department of Education to award a grant to nonprofit organizations that provide school supplies under certain circumstances. Section 7 authorizes the Department of Education to reimburse out of pocket expenses incurred by purchasing supplies for both direct and indirect services in the amount not to exceed $250 per year. Section 8 sets out the specifics regarding the request for reimbursement, and Section 10 contains the appropriation to carry out the program. At this time, I'd like you to direct your attention to the proposed conceptual amendment. I have submitted, which is available on NELIS, in my amendment, I am proposing that the program be changed from a reimbursement method to an annual stipend. This process would greatly reduce the administrative burden required for tracking receipts for individual purchases for all educational personnel. Paired with the governor's plan to raise the budget for supplies reimbursement to 4.5 million per year, which is an 80% increase from what it is the previous years. This will give all direct educational personnel the much needed financial assistance they need to provide our children with the best learning environment possible. So good afternoon, Natha Anderson. 
Uh, I just wanted to bring in a little bit about some of our other education licensed personnel, or OLPs. Um, so I'll just do three very quick examples. First is our speech language pathologist. They're actually not considered to be teachers, although they are teachers. They're working with our pre-K, our K, sometimes all the way up to high school, and helping our students become stronger speakers. And many times they have to use manip manipulatives, some of the same items for other lesson plans, and even equipment that they have to buy on their own. They are not eligible for this reimbursement or other plan as being, as being proposed. I'll keep on going. Our second, <laughs> uh, the second area I'd like to bring up are our counselors. Many of our elementary school counselors in, um, in Washoe County especially, they actually come in and teach lessons to our students on a daily, weekly basis. And so they are also still providing consistent instructional methods for the students. Uh, so I was speaking with a counselor who had been a teacher before and now she's a counselor. Last year she was teaching Cher for the first time. She had to go out and buy some other supplies that she was not even aware that she would have to look into, so those curriculum materials. Finally, our teacher librarians. And this is not the teacher librarians who have a budget at the school. So this would be elements that are not covered by that budget. Uh, this would be instead the teacher librarians who are consistently teaching a different element or something that has to be consistently working with students in, um, in that instruction where maybe they are, uh, for example, utilizing a Legos type of pullout program with a special education group or other lesson plan materials to help our students that sometimes struggle. And again, these are people that are doing consistent lesson planning. Uh, our parapros, we have some of our paraprofessionals who although not licensed are also still providing consistent instruction to some of our more um, selective or specialized education uh, students. I know that I've spoken with a few people and they've expressed some concerns about, well, if it's somebody that's not providing consistent instruction, why should they have it? I, I think we should be open to that amendment. It has to be consistent instruction of students. Uh, so I wanted to give that little bit of background for our other licensed education personnel. Thank you for your consideration. Mr. Chair, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association. Uh, so uh, NSCA uh, represents uh, teachers, other licensed education professionals, uh, and education support uh, professionals uh, across uh, the state. Uh, we're happy uh, to be at the table here with Assemblymember Monk uh, and want to thank her for carrying uh, AB 237 to address uh, the, uh, the, the teacher supply or school supply reimbursement uh, budget and account. Um, Assembly Member Monk mentioned the 2016 uh, questionnaire from the National Center for Education uh, statistics. Uh, I think she mentioned these numbers. 94% uh, of teachers spend their own money on the classrooms with an average of 400 uh, and $79 spent. Um, interestingly enough, uh, NSCA uh, surveyed teachers uh, across the state uh, of Nevada, and while this is not uh, an exact statistical sampling uh, of teachers from across the state, it, it probably uh, trends uh, heavier uh, in the South. Um, I want to point your attention to, uh, if you have the paper, the top slide, or on uh, the overhead here, the slide on the left, um, the reported out-of-pocket expenses uh, that the 1,544 Nevada teachers uh, reported. Uh, so uh, 72 of them uh, reported, you know, zero uh, to $99. Uh, we got a, a several response that I used to spend money in my classroom, but basically I've given up. Well, this is a little sad. Um, 100 to uh, 248. Uh, teachers reported spending between $100 and $249. 326 uh, teachers reported spending between $250 and $499. 475 reported spending between $500 and $999. And 423 uh, teachers reported spending over $1,000 uh, in, uh, in this school year. Uh, the average out-of-pocket uh, spending for uh, these 1,544 Nevada teachers, uh, $704. Uh, 
uh, and 58% of them reported uh, spending 500 or more dollars uh, this school year on uh, school supplies. Um, I did want to uh, address uh, some of the thinking as well behind the amendment uh, that Assemblymember Monk uh, discussed. Uh, the distribution of funds from the school supplies reimbursement account uh, can be bureaucratic uh, and cumbersome. Uh, the timeline of the reimbursement typically does not align with the timing of bigger purchases uh, made by many teachers at the beginning of the school year. Uh, this causes many teachers to not even bother with the process of saving and submitting receipts uh, to access the funds, simplifying the process and of accessing the funds and uh, moving the timeline of that process up uh, into the beginning of the school year, uh, we believe would be a great benefit to educators. And just to uh, bring home this point, I want to point you now to the second chart. Uh, they're either at the second one at the bottom on the, the paper on the right side of the, uh, the screen. Uh, for uh, we also asked, uh, how much do you uh, get in reimbursements? Uh, and this would have been for last school year, uh, not this school year. Um, 974 uh, zero to ninety-nine dollars. That's nine hundred and seventy-four of the one thousand five hundred and forty-four who responded. Uh, nine hundred and forty-five of them were zero. I, I do want to put the caveat that uh, some did say that they uh, took the write-off on the taxes, so a, a teacher is eligible for uh, two hundred and fifty dollars uh, of a teacher. Uh, write off on their federal tax return. Uh, that, of course, is a very different thing than uh, a reimbursement, uh, which is a dollar for dollar uh, reimbursement. Um, 295 uh, teachers uh, said they were reimbursed 100 to 199 dollars, 181, uh, 200 to 299 dollars. Um, so that would include those getting 250 dollars. Uh, and then 48 uh, reported uh, getting back uh, $300, uh, some or more. Uh, some teachers uh, would get money from school fundraisers uh, and that sort of thing and uh, get uh, reimbursed for uh, their school supply receipts from, from those funds uh, related to boosters of, of the schools. Um, the average teacher reimbursement of these 1,544 Nevada teachers, $73. So the average out-of-pocket, $704. The average uh, reimbursed uh, back into the pocket, $73. And the caveat that uh, many teachers do take advantage of the federal, uh, the federal uh, uh, tax uh, benefit of up to $250 off on. It's not $250, but it's a percentage of that. Um, so uh, in, in some of uh, the responses uh, in the survey, uh, many teachers not really having time to do the, the paperwork, uh, thought that uh, it wasn't worth it to do it, uh, lost receipts, um, uh, and that sort of thing, uh, very, very common. Uh, so an amendment to streamline uh, the process uh, for uh, the, the supply reimbursement uh, would I think would be a, a great benefit and it would mean, you know, overall possibly fewer dollars if every uh, educator eligible uh, is getting it as of right, uh, but I think would save a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, and would generally be appreciated uh, across the uh, education class. Thank you. Connie Monk for the record and just to add a little bit about that on the conceptual amendment we're also good with deleting nurses out of that as far as the educational personnel we would add that to the amendment quick you're, you're going to remove them is that what I heard Please. Connie Monk for the record yes because they, we don't consider them the direct educational teaching the students daily okay I'll wait until we get to our questions which are probably coming up though are you you're comp okay okay well we will open it up for questions and I'll just go to that question since it's the lowest hanging fruit so I, I thought I read in the bill that it says um, without limitation um, and I would I'm not trying to debate it but there there could be a situation where a nurse 
is doing some educational activities for our students. So would it be just, I mean, you, you could take it out, but it still actually would be included because it's under the without limitation. Is that correct? That's correct. We do, most of our nurses do not actually do, uh, Natha Anderson, sorry about that. Please don't hate me. Uh, Natha Anderson, for the record. Uh, most of our nurses do, in fact, uh, they do small instructional every once in a while. It's not consistent. And so, I, but I think what you're bringing up is that if it is consistent, that, that sh they should still be available for that. But the majority of our nurses do not do so because of both just how many nurses we have, because we are lacking nurses. And so many of them are having to travel between two and five schools across the state. So I think that's why we are, we are trying to make it just a little bit cleaner and make it direct instruction instead of the indirect instruction. All right, we'll go to Assemblywoman Miller. Thank you, Chair. And Assemblywoman Monk, thank you for bringing this legislation forward. Um, this is one of those things as an educator myself. To, to those of you who aren't educators and who are listening to this bill, it probably sounds so simple. Like, well, that makes sense. This is a bill, reimburse teachers for the supplies they get. And yet we see that um, NSEA just supported a small sprinkling of data that just kind of peeks into what the reality is. And so when we talk about the frustrations of teachers and something this simple, I have to say this was probably the last piece of legislation that I read in my classroom that made me say, enough, I'm running. Because when we see something so simple, so clear as day, and yet we see how it is so uh, distorted by the time it actually gets to your classroom. And again, this is one of those things, that all hands on deck, everybody gets a piece of this between the districts and the school board and, and the bureaucracy and everyone else, that it just doesn't happen the way it's supposed to. So between some schools being discouraged to use it, schools getting different amounts, so I've not still when in the past few years, four years since this was first implemented that we have, you know, one person gets 78, one person gets 108, one's getting 125, one's getting 96. The money doesn't even come until close to the second semester. There's also instances where uh, schools are telling staff what they can and cannot use it for which any educator will tell you these, this money is used, the money they pull out of their pockets for their classrooms are from anything from curriculum, school supplies, uh, sanitary supplies for, for their students, food, clothes, pencils. And in my case, I generally just spend it on plain paper so I can make copies just to actually have something to teach the kids with. So, I think we need to understand how this is so imperative to support, but also the consistency and the streamlining and that educators need to be able to expect to get what is written in law that they're entitled to. So my first question, because again, I know there's the budgetal things, you know, here's the budget will place, but it's divided among my my first question would be oh and and uh, so my first question so chair i have a few questions oh, <laughs> right my first question is how will I, I guess i'll say i i definitely support the idea of a stipend because that will eliminate admin and schools telling teachers what they can and cannot spend it on or directing them to, well, everybody in this grade level or everyone in this hallway, pull your money together to buy this for the school because it's not the intention of the bill. And those things need to be eradicated. So my first question is, how can you guarantee a certain amount so that teachers know what they can expect? Because we have a difference between here's what's in the budget, but it's divided by how many teachers go for it and it's divided by how many uh, teachers, there are, how, how, can you answer that please? Through the chair to Assemblymember Miller, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association. 
So uh, I believe that this budget item is being heard in the subcommittee tomorrow morning. Uh, I think depending on if uh, the amendment to uh, this legislation is adopted, I think that at that point uh, you would have some uh, certainty in terms of the total number of those who are eligible. So you have a, a total number of those who are eligible. Obviously, it will change a little bit based on what districts do in terms of hiring uh, and how many uh, you know, positions are filled at, at whatever time the department uh, decides to move forward with uh, distributing the stipend. And you have a pretty simple division problem of a total amount of money available and a total number of staff who are eligible. And I think that would give us a, a much greater level of certainty about what that dollar figure is in at the end. Okay. Also, in, in uh, the bill in Section 3, it states for that substitute teachers who work 20 consecutive days or more in the same classroom, and most people refer to that as full-time subs, uh, are entitled to this. What about in the case where the subs, maybe they're just, just 22 days? How can we, um, or if the substitute, it, because of when the funding arrives at the schools, they may have already done their long-term substitute position, or they may begin it after. So has there been some consideration for that? Through the chair to Assembly Member Miller, um, I think, you know, there are. State your name for the record. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that there are gaps uh, that are going to exist. Um, and uh, in order to try and fill every gap, I think that you would have to probably create something that is significantly more complicated. And I think that the better policy approach here is, you know, to leave some of those gaps. I think that you just identified a, a long-term sub that comes in after the date that uh, money's distributed. But uh, in terms of making the program as simple, uh, and as streamlined as possible. I think that, unfortunately, there are just going to be some gaps like that one. And final question, Chair. Uh, I would really appreciate if we could, I know that it's been addressed about librarians, but, you know, I'm hearing two different kind of narratives around the librarians, and we know that, uh, and, and we know this is an issue that we are struggling with in Nevada right now, is, you know, the whole idea of having and keeping licensed librarians in our schools, but at least in Clark County, those the schools have a certain budget that they receive for their libraries. And even if they don't have a librarian, that money's still going to the school. So in the case of when we're saying librarians with or without budget or with or without, because again, that role changes. You know, in an elementary school, librarians are teaching classes. So they have students in front of them every day. In, in secondary, they're, they're the resource person in, in, in the library. So they see students every day, but again, they, they have separate budgets. So could you just kind of, where are you on that? Uh, Natha Anderson, to be able to answer to the best of my ability, because I think that each district has our, our teacher librarians set up differently with the way the budget is being handled even for the elementary school and the middle school and the high school, in the same district even. Uh, so it's, it's, I wish it was a nice, clean, here's the answer, but I think it's something that we might have to discuss a little bit further to find some proper language to address that issue because it is not consistent across our state. Each school district deals with our teacher librarians a little bit different with the budgets, and each school does too, possibly. And so there's gotta be a way that we can address this in a consistent fashion. But I don't know what that is. But I look forward to the discussion to figure that out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Assemblywoman Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Assemblywoman Monk and members of the NSEA for coming forth with this legislation. I mean, I know in my own classroom that I'm definitely in that upper end of money spent, and I was only in the classroom for five months this school year. Um, but I, I know how quickly that that money adds up. I'm also the daughter of an educator, so I got to see firsthand how my mom was spending hundreds of dollars on her classroom instead of on her three kids at home um, because she knew that she had about 200 other kids 
at school. So I can see how difficult it is for um, our, our working parents, really. To, uh, you're choosing one over the other um, and, and really just the sacrifices that we make for our students. The one concern that I do have with this legislation, um, I know that you, you in the amendment you put to put the money towards the beginning of the school year, I think that it has to be more explicit. <laughs> I think we have to have it like that that money will be paid by the end of September, that, that first paycheck that we are receiving in the school year. Um, but I think if we put the beginning of the school year, it's a little, it's still a little too vague. So just making sure that that's explicit. We will go to Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just, I think this is a piece of legislation, a good bill to be brought forward. And I know as a mother, I appreciated my daughters both had wonderful teachers that definitely went above and beyond and spending their own money and um, I was very appreciative of that and knew, I know that it was um, a strain and a sacrifice for a lot of them. So I just wanted to go back and um, look at the amendment a little bit about the stipend. So if you go with a stipend, and maybe you answered some of this already, <coughs> but um, so would that be like an automatic, they would, they would just get the stipend once you determine who's eligible, um, so they would automatically get that. And then um, once the budget's determined, let's say, and you determine who's eligible, let's say the stipend would be less than $250, would they still be able to submit reimbursements? Or I mean, like if it's less than what they're already getting, um, if you go that route, have you thought about that? Connie Monk, for the record, yeah, the stipend will be at the beginning of the school year. Um, if this bill passes, it will be in effect of July of 19. So at the beginning of the school year, uh, we haven't determined yet whether it's going to be a prepaid card or a check. Um, and it would depend, in my understanding of what we're going to do with this, is how many educational professionals there are in that school and that district. Yeah, because I, I would just, you know, be concerned that what if, I think um, Assemblywoman Miller mentioned that, say what if it's only $80 and they could submit reimbursements for, you know, more than that. Through the chair uh, to Assemblymember Hardy, it's a, a good question. Uh, I, I think that it's Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association. Um, it's, uh, it, it's good to realize that uh, currently, there are limitations uh, on how much uh, you're able uh, to get reimbursed, and uh, you know, just per uh, at least the 1,500 teachers that we were able to survey this school year, uh, an overwhelming majority uh, don't take advantage of it. Um, those that do still hit a cap uh, in terms of uh, that their school district sets in terms of the amount of money available. The other good news, uh, depending on the outcome of the discussions in, in the budget sub subcommittee and then uh, the budget with the enhancements that Governor Sisolak has recommended. Uh, it seems like we could move uh, to this process to having it as a stipend uh, that all of the elegi all eligible uh, educators get without that dollar figure really being much lower uh, than it currently is. Um, and that's uh, uh, thankfully due to the uh, budget uh, appropriation that uh, Governor Sisolak uh, made in January. Okay, so it's kind of dependent on a couple of things, the budget and how many people are determined to be eligible and, and, and so forth. Thank you. I have a follow-up question, um, kind of to that process. So, and I'm just trying to make it as, as basic as possible. So a, a school will be given a pot of money and how will they determine, will there be a requisition process? Because I thought I heard you say in your, that it's not a reimbursement anymore, that you're going to it, it, clarify that part. And then also, is there going to be a tier approach to who's priority? Because if you, like, I'm not trying to create like who's better in the school system, but will there be a, a tiered system um, now that you're expanding it beyond teachers on who would be 
eligible for the dollars first. Mr. Chairman, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association. So, uh, you know, early uh, stage of the conceptual amendment process. Uh, right now, uh, the assembly uh, member will be relying on uh, the work of uh, Legislative Council Bureau and uh, the department, but the language is to uh, have the department decide uh, the method of payment. Uh, and currently, there is no contemplation of a tier. So it would be a simple uh, math problem of the total amount of dollars available divided by the total number uh, of employees who are eligible uh, for the money at that, at that set date, hopefully early in the school year. So as a follow-up, what if I don't use my portion? I, I mean, I th that's allocated because now you're blocking up someone else that may have more expenses. So I, what I'm saying is I'm not trying to get into like funding formula language and stuff. I mean, you know, it, it's not about, is it about being equal or is it about being equitable? Like if, if some teachers or some staff from the school have higher demands versus those that like, I don't need the money. Through the chair, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, actually, to the chair. Um, I think equity is uh, a great goal. Um, I think with the uh, dollar amounts that we're talking about, we don't even have uh, equality in terms of the money coming uh, to educators. It's uh, more so those who are together enough to uh, put in the paperwork and go through the process uh, to get the reimbursement. Uh, and I have not seen data uh, as to uh, which educators and which schools and which districts uh, are able to be more successful at that, but most teachers do not uh, put in for all that they are eligible for currently. And, and let me make this clear before they say, yes, and we meant Thompson saying this and that, Chair Thompson saying this. I'm saying when I was talking about the equity, I mean within that school. I'm not saying the distribution of dollars, you know, equity that way. I'm just saying once you get your pot of money, and, and I guess this kind of goes to what I was trying to get at with the prioritization and tiering, you know. So, all right. Good so, conversation. Uh, Nathan Anderson uh, to Chair Thompson. Uh, so that question was actually brought up yesterday when I was talking with some of our educators that were up here uh, yesterday just to, to meet with different legislators. And one is a 33-year veteran. As, a, as an educator, and one is, I think, in her ninth year of teaching. And one, she's the 33-year um, educator said, I I'm not gonna try for this. There's no need for me to have it, which, okay, thank you for that honesty. And she said, but you know what? I mentor every year another teacher. And she oftentimes, this, this educator is an incredibly positive individual. She oftentimes times take her to, takes her mentor teachers to target on her own. And so she'd be like, I just, I would help one of our mentor teachers. Do I realize, do I believe that every single one of the teachers that don't need that would do it? I'm not that naive. But I do believe that there are a few that would actually want to help one of our newer teachers, some of our mentor teachers, because that very issue, I've been teaching the same thing for 20 years. I don't need, I mean, we all know to look for the Office Depot penny sale. I was just like Assemblymember Torres where I was one of the people that was brought in to buy the 10 spiral notebooks for my mom too, because you can only buy so many. Um, but it's those sort of things that really shows that you can help each other. And so I think that's what you're trying to get at is how do we, how do we make sure that that first, second, third year teacher is getting the help they need and not just that 25, 27 year teacher. Okay, any further questions? All right, we will move to support for Assembly Bill 237. Please come forward. <laughs> 